Hello everybody, welcome back to the James Lawrence Alcott channel and in particular, welcome back to a very, very special edition of Dream Teams. I'm so excited about this as a QPR fan, but also as, as a broadcaster as well, because I think the person that we're going to be talking to today is actually one of the most articulate and refreshing voices to sort of come from professional players now starting to become pundits. And he's also got a podcast as well, which we need to talk about, because... Meta Manua joins me right now on Dream Teams and uh, your podcast, Kick Back with Neda Manua. It's, it's really good, mate. It's really, really good. Like, trust me, like someone who's kind of been in this world for a little while now, you see lots of players stop playing and then start talking. And often they don't have that much to say or, or, <laughs> or, they're, or at least they're maybe a little bit guarded. I think the thing I'm really yeah. enjoying about the podcast and also the other work that you're doing at the moment is that... You don't care, like, like in a good, polite way. Yeah. You, do, you don't care. Is that is that is that you? Um, you that? There, I think as a player, I was somebody who would think about everything that I would say anyway. That whole sense of being guarded, but I also appreciate the fact that people like you more when you show a bit of personality. Yeah. But there's a sort of um, balance because some people throw a lot of personality in which would then say go into war of words with people like that and I'm not mm -hmm. concerned about that at all so I felt that um, I started the podcast almost two years ago now and this is obviously while I was playing mm -hmm. and I thought to myself well the beauty of the show which I do now looking back is the fact that for some of the people who come on it gives them a chance to tell their own story instead of somebody tell it for them. Yeah. Because I think for people in the public eye and so on, they're reading about themselves all the time, people's opinions of them, people's opinions of the decisions, you know, their upbringing, whatever. Mm. And this is, it's not, it's not a way to almost like make it right or whatever, but people can be more honest when they do talk about themselves. And then also, I think you can pick up from their personality as well, what they really like, because ultimately, yeah, so you know, yeah. we're with someone every single day, you know what they're like, but for others, they only see them on a Saturday or see them when they do an interview talking about the game that's to come on the Saturday. Mm. So I think providing people a platform to be able to, as I say, speak openly, honestly, and so on, then things make a bit more sense. You get to see more sides to a story. And as I say, you can buy into it because there's someone you might like already who's on there and then you learn more about them. Or it might be someone you dislike and all of a sudden you understand why maybe they did something which you maybe don't like. And then as for the whole punditry situation itself now, again, because I've just left the game, I'm still cl more closely aligned with playing than not playing. Mm. But one thing which I always well, hated... And you should still be playing. Why are you... What, I mean... I just didn't. I, to be honest, I didn't want to. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, yeah. That's what I... I mean, again, a, a, you know, an answer that's, that's honest. I, I like that. I think... Uh, look, just to say with this, I think... I'm, the reason I went uh, straight to you is because I saw that as a as a QPR fan when you were a player that you did have that honesty about you and so in this dream teams of course we're gonna you know splinter off to different uh, talking points on some of these players and I think some of the players within this I mean I can see three right in front of me right now as I look at it are players that are I would I would suggest are misunderstood by a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I'm going to be curious if that's okay. I'm going to ask questions. If I go Absolutely. too far, you tell me to shut up. No, and, no, no, uh, no, no, no. And we'll and we'll go from there if that's cool. Listen, I'll, I'll I'll give you my opinion on those players, and those opinions might be more rooted in reality than people realise because you never really hear the full story. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'll be more than happy to share those with you. Well, that's exactly what I'm excited about because I think I think that is the case. You know, football fans, it's weird. You see sort of a a style of of how someone plays, and you should, you kind of pin that on their personality, and that's not always the case. As much that's as it. the idea that you can't. You can't always get your side of the story out a lot. Of the yeah, time. that's 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 the key thing, which I was going to say as a pundit. Now I'm very wary that the words that I say will be heard by lots of people, but not necessarily be able to have a response to it. So if I'm yeah. going to talk about somebody in particular and they're not there to sort of say something back as a retort, I think well, there's no point in me really saying that, you know. And I think as a player, we do see well, as a former player, you, it could get quite frustrating because narratives are set about you, and you yeah. don't have a say in it. And that's unfortunately the case with a lot of players. So as I say, I'm trying to be a bit more wary in that industry and just making sure that sort of the impact that you have, if it doesn't have to be over the top negative and someone can't defend themselves, then really is it worth saying? Because I know there's a thing for clicks and outrage and all that, but you're not going to get that from me. I think you're finding the balance really well, mate. I'm really, I've am really, i been really impressed. And as I say, I'm excited to, to go through elements of your career, but also your dream team based on the players that, that mattered to you. So let, let's get into it. Uh, just for those of you who somehow don't know the background to Nedamanua's career, I 
obviously was able to live for quite a lot of it, especially <laughs> certain certain playoff finals, uh, at, which uh, which we'll definitely get into. Um, but Nedham played for Manchester City. He was on uh, on loan at Sunderland for a season, then went to the mighty Queens Park Rangers for about seven seasons, I think, 2012 it's to six, six and a half years it was. Six, six and, and a half years, yeah. Uh, and then finished off at Rail Salt Lake, who weirdly, actually, when I was 20, I um, I coached for ML, for the MLS in America, and I okay. went to Utah, Went to I coached for Rail Salt Lake. So uh, when you went there, I was like, ah, I, that yeah, I remember that world, place. Yeah. yeah, beautiful, beautiful part of, the, uh, part of America. Um, so let's get cool. into your team. Let's start with your goalkeeper. We were talking about your formation. I'll tell you what, give mm. people your formation to give them a bit, a bit of a clue and then tell us about your goalkeeper okay so the formation is a four three three of which the holder the six in midfield is somebody who you expect to see somewhere else but having been with said person from the very beginning <laughs> of their time in england it makes sense to me and i'll explain why he's been put there but my goalkeeper i'm going with uh, joe hart so you know, there's a huge sense of bias here, bias here because Joe Hart is one of my best friends in football and best friends outside of football. And I was at City when he was bought from Shrewsbury and he arrived as this prospect and so on. And I remember his eyes being wide open, like, oh my God, this is Man City, this is this. But that's not the Man City of today. That was the old Man City. Like, this is a guy who he played non-league. Yeah. I think he played in League Two. Then he was, a, um, then I'd say he came to City. And he's a real... He's, he's very misunderstood, I'll be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, he, I've, backed, I've tried to kind of give Joe Hart a break on, on football media for quite a few years, and it's been kind of thrown back in my face. Yeah. Why, why do you think he's misunderstood? I think he's misunderstood because when he was at the very, very top, uh, he was confident. I don't, wouldn't say he was cocky, he was confident. But one thing which uh, people decided to disregard at that point is how much he loved the game itself. Like he loved playing football. He loved being with his teammates. You won't find a teammate that he's been with throughout his entire career who thought he ever did cross the line and so on. But unfortunately for the way that perceptions can be created, and as I was talking about in terms of narratives and stuff like this, as a goalkeeper, at some point you'll make a mistake. And when those mistakes, those mistakes never end up costing goals. So for him, he was trapped in a position whereby I feel, you know, he's still trying to exude confidence. But if you now put a mistake next to it, people start thinking more, maybe he doesn't care. Maybe he's getting ahead of himself and so on and so forth. But that wasn't the case for him at all. Mm. And then very quickly, as far as football goes, the moment you kind of push to the side, it's very hard to get back in. Because I think, I'll be honest with you, there, there aren't 20 better goalkeepers than him in the Premier League right now but he can't get a starting job in the Premier League as it stands. And that kind of blows my mind because as I say, I saw him from when he was young, played with him a little bit in the reserves, then played with him in the first team, then saw what he did for City. And he's one of the best keepers that City have ever had. I think he's one of the best goalkeepers that England have ever had. And as I say, he loves the game. I was, I was lucky enough to have been at Wembley um, uh, yet, oh, for the Carabao Cup final. And he's doing taking the shots from the players before the game and so on. And you see him giving the back and forth with the players and he's loving it. He's making big saves. He's celebrating them and all this. And that's somebody who's a number two yeah. playing against his old team. He's got every reason to basically throw his toys out of the pram, but he doesn't. Mm. The guy works hard every single day. And then also the thing which really confirms his slot in there. Um, so I like to think myself as being quite tough mentally. <laughs> but when we were at City together, we used to do shooting drills and he'd be saying to me, like, you're not going to score, you're not going to score, you're not going to score. And I probably went through six months where I couldn't score against him. <laughs> oh, no, he had make, you. Make, you know, I was making, he's living in my brain, he was rent free. <laughs> but he wasn't, because I, like, I was throwing everything at him. I was throwing huge strikes towards the top corner as he was getting there. And ultimately, when you have a goalkeeper that sort of has that level of confidence and he's playing behind you and you know he's a very good shot stopper, when I played with him, like it was, it was a dream. I've been lucky to play with some great goalkeepers, talking like Casper Schmeichels and stuff, who was in my academy team and all that. But Joe Hart, for me, he's one of the best England goalkeepers ever. And it's a shame to see that he's not playing games now because, as I say, there aren't 20 better goalkeepers than him. I'd probably say they're not even 10. But unfortunately, um, the way that football works sometimes, you get put in these situations and it's very hard to escape perception. I think the, the goalkeeper position is so difficult because what, what made him supposedly great was almost part of his downfall as well. There was a lot of talk about him. You know, when he came in, it's like, you know, he took command of it. Yes, there were great saves, but, you know, he's barking those orders. Um, you know, better with his feet than people give him credit for as well. I think yeah, just, that just became a really big story with Pep Guardiola. Yeah. But then I just think if you're a goalkeeper and you're at the top for long enough, I almost feel like, I wonder if, and I've seen this with a few of these dream teams, and maybe I'm just being optimistic, but I wonder if that the last 10 years with social media, 
has been so kind of and both the social media and the press and how footballers behaved and by that i mean they they were afraid so they kept generally quite quiet uh, in in terms of their their interactions with people they were, they were there was a distance it feels like those walls are kind of breaking down a little bit but joe hart within all of that it's like if you're if you're there long enough you'll get you'll get torn down and i felt yeah. like with goalkeepers in particular you're sort of remembered more for your mistakes than you are for, for the opposite. Someone That's like David right. Seaman, what a career he had, right? But couldn't, yeah. but is known for Naeem and the uh, Ronaldinho uh, moment, yeah. right? And I felt like with Joe Hart, people couldn't kind of wash past that. It then teamed up with the, um, with um, Bravo coming in, who was, who was terrible, by the way. <laughs> Might have been better with his feet. So I, mean, I can say it, but he was, he was, you know, he, and again, he's not a bad goalkeeper. He's had an unbelievable career, but I think it's almost sad that, how it ends seems to paint such a picture because I think yeah. Joe Hart was a very, very good goalkeeper. He, he was a very good goalkeeper and he still is a very good goalkeeper. But one thing as well, in terms of goalkeepers playing for England, they do well for a section and at some point they do get torn down. Because yeah. we're even hearing discussions now about Pickford being this or Pickford being that. Paul Robinson, he, it was the same thing, exactly. wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, as I say, but unfortunately, position they play, you know, you're one mistake away from being called unreliable. And once that happens and that narrative goes, you know, how do you prove somebody wrong? Because you go back to doing the job that you were doing, but they'll say, yeah, but you made a mistake six months ago. And that mistake there, you know, that's probably why I'm not confident in you anymore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, great choice. And I guess the final thing, because I do want to kind of get your perception on a lot of these things when you're building a team, as you know, as a centre back or, or a right back. Is that the kind of goalie you wanted? Did you want that big voice? 100%. Um, but it's more than a big voice. It's the sort of like, it's the big presence, the fact that he does make some very big saves in big moments, which only certain goalkeepers, you know, will make. Like I've had some, as I say, some great goalkeepers in terms of shot stoppers, but then also things like coming out for a cross, catching a cross, coming off his line and affecting the game that way. Because to talk about the other side of that coin, the toughest spell I had um, in terms of all that was, uh, say, towards the end of my career, because was, there was a goalkeeper we had for RSL who, you know, is a legend over there and so on. But he was very different to what this is because he was a bit shorter. So he was, I think he was like five nine, five ten. Wow. Um, and he was a, he was a bit older as well. So I think he was turning forty years of age. So he's earned the right to be in that in the MLS. He was great. He's played for the national team, all that stuff. But I didn't necessarily see the best of him in that time. Sure. But the yeah. best of him was the stuff which I was. The, the stuff, as I say, which I was used to was a big commanding goalkeeping presence. Somebody who come out, as I say, be jumping above everybody, taking those, feeling more confident coming off their line, you know, having maximum mobility to be able to get to absolutely everything. Like uh, mm. Nick Romando, the guy, he was like, as I say, he's a legend at MLS and he, he's earned the right to, to have that tag. But he's very different to what I'd experienced beforehand. And again, he was somebody who was good with his feet and all that stuff, but in the Premier League, for example, or just anywhere in England, if there's a short goalkeeper, you know it's going to be like carnage. <laughs> carnage. Yeah, going to get yeah exactly. Someone like Joe Hart. Like, that feeling, like it's sad, but that feeling when a cross is coming in and, you're on, and the team's under pressure and the keeper comes and just claims it and yeah. stuff. Oh, mate, it's heaven. It's absolutely <laughs> heaven. That's it. Because I, I talk about this a lot in, in, in the content that I make, is that I think concern is a, is a really big thing. You know, if so, if you're concerned about the opposition, then you're going to defend deeper. You're going to have more defensive players. Blah blah blah. Same goes with a goalkeeper, or, or if you're playing centre back, I would imagine as well, where you're like, if you don't have to worry, kind of going back yeah. as much, then you've got less to worry about, and you can concentrate yeah. on that element of the game in front of you, right? Yeah, one hundred percent. And even that thing, if you have a goalkeeper who's really good with the decision making coming off the line, like imagine playing in front of like a Manuel Neuer for the last 10, 15 years, where you know if a through ball is played, there's a yeah, good chance the keeper's going to be there. Yeah. So you're running less, you're panicking less. And you know, as I say, in those big, big moments, like I was lucky enough as well. Oh, I played with a guy called Alex Smithers as well at QPR, as you know. Amazing. And the team wins a penalty. And I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah, very good chance we're going to save this. Yeah. A, and that, as I say, that's a, that type of psychology. It makes a big difference because not only do we feel it when he's on our team, I think the opposition feel it as well. Mm. And you know that this is going to be tough to score against this person or this person's strength is going to make us a bit weaker and wherever and all that type of psychology. You don't talk about it during the time. Yeah. But as I say, it does affect the way that you play the game. And it builds, doesn't it? You know, it's it's one like if you come and get one cross, but then you punch the next one, and then you drop the next one. That's one thing. Mm. But that consistency of that, which again seems to get forgotten with a lot of goalkeepers, um, yeah, is, sure. is a big thing. Uh, let's move on to your right back. Of course, you you played right back a lot and centre back a lot. I, I always got the impression you didn't really enjoy playing right back. Is that true? I 
Uh, it depended who I was playing for and what the style of team was because there were times when, say, at City, for example, I'd play right back, say, under Mancini, and the whole role is to just get forward. So it's a lot more fun when you're doing that. Yeah. But when you're doing it and, like, your team doesn't really keep possession, doesn't really have an attacking sort of style or whatever, mm. then it's it's just basically just a centre-back playing at right back, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But um, I So I, I came through at City and I first entered the team at right back because um, Kevin Keegan, the manager at the time, wanted me to get better on the ball. So I was learning to play that position while I had Richard Dunn and Sylvain Distan to the left of me. And, um, it, it, you know, it helps. It works. I had to see the game from a different perspective because throughout my, say, academy times and so on, I was either a striker or a centre-back. Those were the wow. two options. I, wasn't, I was never out wide. Yeah, I used to be prolific as well. That's the thing. But <laughs> until the incident, until the incident where I got played through one on one, I think it was the last preseason game under seventeen year. Got played through one on one, kicked it wide, and from that point, I don't think I ever played up front yeah. again. Oh, and so that's why Joe Hart's in your was in your head as well, because it's not just well, oh, I'm a right back try- or centre back trying to well, score some goals. You're a striker in your heart. I had in the academy times. I had, I had a bit of finesse about me, but that stuff seemed to just disappear as I got older. But um, yeah, like I was saying, uh, I've played actually. I played up front with Ishmael Miller. I think some QPR guys yeah, might yeah, know. Of course, yeah. So it used to be the two of us up front. So um, yeah, so I was playing right back and I was learning the game and so on. I had an easy introduction because I had those two legends to the left of me and I had Sean Wright Phillips ahead of me. Great. So my intro to professional football ultimately was very easy, even though the City team wasn't exactly what it is today. It was very easy because I was protected from every single side, uh, and ultimately I could just be a centre back playing at right back and just def- doing the defensive part and then rolling it forward. Mm. Um, but as I say, so I spent some time there. And then the next in line to me defensively coming through the academy was Micah and it ended up that the two of us were kind of vying for the same spot. But sometimes I'd be centre back, sometimes he'd be right back and so on. But I remember him in the academy and what some people don't know, he was playing, he was playing the centre, he was a central midfielder. Like when really? Micah Rich was first coming through, yeah, that's what he was. And then he went through a similar sort of thing with me where he got pushed to that position to get better on the ball. And he came through and then before you know it, he's after we've come through the same sort of system, he's then the youngest ever England international. Yeah. You know, he's hit the ground running and all this stuff. And I remember, I think his first, one of his first games was against Arsenal at Highbury. And he played because I was supposed to start, but I was I was an injury doubt. And on the day, I, just, I couldn't play. Yeah. So Mikey came in, he cracked on. And obviously his path would have been his path anyway. But he ended up, as I say, having so many highs for Man City, so many highs for England. This was like a talent that, as I say, I saw in the academy come out and become something incredible. And certain elements of it was like, I'd argue that it came at my own expense. Yeah. But what a good guy to be able to, as I say, be competing alongside, would never take anything away from any of his teammates and stuff like that. Was always happy to be around people, made it as competitive as possible and always wanted to be better. And as I say, the career that he had at that point, you know, he was... He was gone. He was he was a star. I remember walking yeah. through uh, Manchester and like, so I don't know if the younger audience remember, but there were things called phone boxes. And <laughs> I remember like, his face was all over them on the national level. And he, as I say, he was a huge star. And he was probably, apart from Sean Wright Phillips, he was the next huge star to come from the academy. And I watched it happen myself and to be able to spend time with him, play with him. You know, he was, he was exceptional because there was a point where no matter who he's playing against, you were like, well, there's no point even trying to take him on because that's that's going to be for him and not for them. Yeah, I think it was with him. I remember his, it might have been his England debut and I think he played, you talk about the, the player that plays in front of you. I think David Beckham mm. played in front of him. David Beckham by this point, you know, David Beckham was kind of known for his stamina, never known for his pace. But the older he got, it was truly about his positioning because he yep. would playing as a winger, but he would get the ball out wide and just put that ball in first time. So he didn't yeah. have that pace at all. But they played Micah Richards alongside him. And Micah Richards, his like exuberance at the start of his career and and the sort of the, that raw pace that he seemed to have. And I guess mm. it's, it comes because, you know, you yourself, you, you were a, you know, a fantastic sprinter, had, had that great pace as well. But with Micah Richards, I think what was felt so explosive about it was that there was no handbrake on it. It was like I'm yeah. going forward, and 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 both. It also helped him in the other way, where there yeah. were those kind of recovery runs that he could get himself possibly out of trouble. And also, again, when you're maybe looking at it with rose tinted glasses at the start of his career, you just look at the wow of it, not maybe yeah. the pos- p- positioning of it, right? Yeah, he. I think with Michael, he got himself better tactically the more he played. And then when, say, um, Mancini came in, like he couldn't be in that team and not understand the sort of every sort of tactical 
element of the game of football itself. But with Mikey, you're exactly right. Like when he would say, for example, when he's running forward, he'd be he was great at running forward with the, with the ball, and he's literally getting get he's putting you on the back foot. And when I say the back foot, I literally mean the back foot. He's coming at you, and you don't know whether he's going right, left, straight, whatever. Mm. But also, you know that you can't make it a physical contest because he will literally push you out of the way. Yeah. So there were so many people who were having were being squared up who'd probably never been squared up before by a right back at any point, mm. but they were having to take it. And ultimately, he had the physical, he had the physical strength. He had the desire to go and try and affect things. And as I say, there weren't many people who suited him as a matchup. And I think he got better and better. But then obviously, I think due to injuries and stuff like that, I think some of that momentum kind of derailed a little bit. But he's somebody, as I say, who I saw hit the very peak and to see it happen um, through somebody who I knew, somebody who I was competing with was, was great. So that's why I was in my team. Yeah, I guess in such a competitive world for you to, you know, it's your career or, you know, and it is your spot. You think that you're you're losing there for, to, for you to feel okay about it. I mean, speaks volumes. For uh, it's, it's, listen, it was, it was tough because again, like, so Michael ended up playing some games at centre back, but ultimately I think he wanted to be a right back and me at right back, I wanted to be a centre back. Yeah. So in time, I ended up playing more games at centre back and it wasn't like we were competing for four, five, six years or anything. Yeah. But the fact that, say, sometimes the centre-backs would be established, it meant that maybe I'd go out to the right and so on. But then before you know it, you know, there was my focus was literally playing centre-back. And from there, there was, there was no stress whatsoever. Yeah. With Mika Richards, obviously, you know, people know him as, uh, I guess younger people know him more as a, as a pundit now. And everyone is loving what he's doing. Like, you know, his personality is so re- refreshing in comparison. And I think I've said it a few times, he kind of offers that balance when you've got Roy Keane and Graham Sooners yeah. there. Yeah. Someone who's going to, yeah. like Roy Keane will say, something incredibly offensive Mika will laugh it off and we can carry on moving forward yeah um, but he's yeah he's been such a breath of fresh air with that but people do forget that when he was at Aston Villa and we can kind of move on to to one of your centre-backs here because I, I think you can kind of pair them up together with the fact that you both played for the, with them at Man City yeah. but both of them and I'll, I'll sort of name drop this next one Jolien Lescott is, is one of your, your centre-backs him and Mika Richards in the season that uh, Aston Villa went down from the Premier League the feeling towards the pair of them was, was yeah. pretty nasty. It was pretty nasty. Yeah. And uh, yeah. like we said at the start, you know, sometimes people don't have that kind of right of reply. And Micah Richards has had such a heel turn in terms of how people really, really, sh- you know, have so much love for him now. But it wasn't the case, was it? It really wasn't the case no. for both of them. There's a lot of hatred there. Yeah, there was. There was a lot of hatred, yeah. But I think some of that comes with the fact that what they were coming, I think they were both coming from Man They both came from Man City at the time. So Man City overall, even though the as a club they're loved by their own fans, they're not necessarily loved by people from the outside because ultimately they have more money, more resources and whatever than other people. So people know that if you arrive at Man City, someone says, Oh, you just joined a super team to try and get success, or you're just doing this for money and so on and so forth. Like now the money conversation has changed because they are so successful. But yeah. around the time when Jolene went or whatever people would be saying, oh, you're a bit greedy of this, that, and the other. But Jolene did an excellent job for City, as did Micah. And then the step away to a club as big as Aston Villa, like Aston Villa are a huge club, mm. and to be a huge club which was struggling as badly as they were. And for those players themselves now, they're in a different environment where, as I say, the, the expectation isn't to win five games a month. You know, the hope is now to be able to win a couple of games in a row to try and get themselves out of a relegation spot. Now, that's a different type of mentality to have on board. And although they were trying their best to contribute, I don't think they, the fans didn't see the best of them. Yeah. And then it probably makes it worse then because of where they came from. Well, yeah, I think, I think with QPR, you would have experienced it your, yourself. Yeah, it's one of those players yeah. that moved once we, once we had the money. I think yeah. as a QPR fan, I think the perception certainly with you was that you know, your with your style of play and the way you held yourself, you were always you were always very honest. But hmm. that that second season after we stayed up, yeah, it was a disaster. Yeah. Of, it was a disaster. Yeah, and the likes of because I put Julian Lescott and Micah Richards. When you come from Man City and you go to Aston Villa, the the expectations are are still kind of like halfway in between the two. And so we brought yep. in players like. I don't even like to say his name on the channel, but Basingwa and uh, Ji Sung Park was another one who you were like, well, he's played for he's played for Man United. So he's going to be brilliant. He gets the captain's armband. But he was a water carrier for Man United. So then when he comes down and he's supposed to be the guy, that's a really high expectations to to deal with. 
Yeah, exactly. Especially when you look at those two players essentially being centre-backs as well. Like if you were an attacker, you know what I mean? You could have had a tough season in terms of style of play, but then you could still score some goals and you're, you're an icon, you know. <laughs> when we look at teams who ultimately struggle in the Premier League and so on, the ones who seem to get away the easiest are goal scorers and goalkeepers because goalkeepers end up scoring a, conceding a lot of goals, but they also have to make a lot of saves. Yeah. So it seems like they're keeping their teams in it, but they're getting more of a workout than other goalkeepers around the league. Mm. But in terms of defenders and stuff, unless you're scoring a ton of goals in a side that's going to be struggling or whatever, there's no there's no credit to be given to you at all. Mm. So then the value or the cost of those players and stuff, it feeds into it. And I think those two, when I speak to those two guys, they, they're open and admit that that was a tough time for them. They know they didn't play as well as they could have done and should have done, mm. but it wasn't due to intent from where they were coming from. But at times it feel like, feels like that's the perception of it. So to go to uh, Jolene now as a player as well. So... Um, I'd played against Jolien a few times when he was at Everton and he had a couple of great seasons there. I think there was one year where he scored maybe 10 goals in the league or something from, and I think it was from left back and he was exceptional. So then when he came over to City, like I'm playing centre back at this point, so he's a bit of a rival to me and so on. Yeah. But when he walked into the building, that was a change at City where some of the people who were coming in were the best professionals you could ever wish to see. And which was interesting because that's the point when the talent was getting higher. And I think throughout my career, I've seen people who've had talent, but haven't had that work ethic who wonder why they're not at the very top. Mm. But like I say, some of the best players at City have ever had, they've, they've been tireless workers as well. And the desire to win everything, whether it's first into the training ground, whether it's the first goal in training, you know, the last goal in training, whatever, they will fight for everything. And Jolene was somebody who, you know, I ended up, looking up to quite a bit because he came in and he wasn't the big name in the building. He cost some money, but he wasn't the big name in the building, but he worked his socks off to become an integral part of the team, which won the Premier League. Yeah. And the stuff he was doing, like that's the stuff that sort of inspired me to, I wasn't unprofessional, but I became more professional and had a greater understanding of what was required to be at the very top from looking at people like him to see his story, say from when he was at Wolves, you know, Wolves in the championship or whatever to get going to Everton and doing well for Everton to then being at City and having to adapt again and not feeling like the odd one out amongst a team of stars. Mm. He was as important to that team as anybody else on that field. And as I say, I think he, he earned the right to be there by the hard work that he put in on and off the field. And so for me, like I love playing with him as well because there, I think as a centre back, you can be a good centre back, but I think you're a better one when you have a good partner yeah. because the two of you on the same page are far more effective than two of you on a different one. Mm. And he's somebody who I was always on the same page of whenever we played. And I love playing with him. You know, you make a tackle, high five, and you win ahead of your high five, and read something, high five, and but then you're always demanding more and more and more from each other. The better you play, the better the other other person's played. So I think some of my best games were alongside him. So that's why he's in my team. I love that. I love the idea that, you know, it, this is a team sport and and there's yeah. so many little things that we will never see or hear that on a football pitch you can you can say or you can you can that can kind of alleviate a moment of pressure or heighten that that confidence in a player and I think that's there are I always think with football there's 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 sort of pairings all over the pitch you know you're two centre yes. midfielders two centre backs you're, you're right back and your winger you're two centre forwards if you're, if you're playing them and and so with those centre backs it's interesting to hear that about someone like Lescott one thing I did want to talk about with Lescott is you use the word intent there I think that's that really interests me because as someone who's <laughs> played for you know, for Man City and and then played for QPR in those years where it felt like the intent of a, a lot of players wasn't always right. Yeah. On a, I know this is such a tough question, but percentage wise, in terms of the good intentions of of the players within squads, how how many of it is you know are are there good intentions? And generally, should we always as as supporters and fans look at look at players and think they are always trying their best? Or like, how much of a percentage would you suggest that either either but subconsciously they're not giving enough, or or just point blank they're not? Because I, think, I guess in mm. any workplace you have different personalities, and some good or some some are bad. I just wondered what you thought about that. I, th I think ultimately, people who have the wrong sort of intent of they're a small minority. Mm. But within a team sport, it only takes one or two people being off to completely affect everything. And I think one thing which has to be part of the conversation with me being completely honest, people are motivated by different things, but the motivation still remains the same. There are people who, for example, might come to a club and they might dream of going to another club, 
But that dream of going to another club is what drives them to play well for said club. Right. There are other players who want to be a legend at a club, so that that's what's driving them. You know what I mean? There are some yeah. people who are obsessed with money and want to get as much money as possible. But how do you do that? You earn that through performance. And that's a thing. That is a straight up thing. There's people. That's just that's a straight up thing. Yeah. But when you think about it all those three motivations still provide the best performances for the said club itself, mm-hmm. you know? So we should be very wary of just describing intent as being one thing yeah. or, you know, yeah. motivation being one thing, because ultimately everyone is different. Like you look at a team, they might have a 17 year old and a 35 year old, the 35 year old is looking to try and get one more year. Well, how does he do it? He earns it. The 17 year old is trying to start a career. How does he do that? He earns it. You know what I mean? So it's two different motivations and whatever. Um, so, I'd say the vast majority of people, whatever they're motivated by, it makes no difference because their desire to work hard and play well. If they play well, then the team plays well. If the team does well, you know, everybody's rewarded, whatever they think the reward's important. But there are some other people where, but I think we see, well, I think we kind of see this in life anyway. When when the proverbial hits the fan, Mm. you know, they go within themselves and they kind of stop trying because they think, well, if they stop trying, then it's not to do with me. The failure is not my fault. Yeah. Because for others, when things like when things are great, you know, they'll pull out the tricks, they'll be doing whatever, they'll start showbiting, blah, blah, blah. Mm. But like I say, there are some who really want to distance themselves when things get tough. And I think they're the ones with the wrong sort of intent. But there aren't many people like that. I guess, yeah. But, I guess maybe that's a is that maybe a different thing? Is that that's bravery and, and courage and, and grit? No, nah, nah, I don't I don't I don't think it is because I think I could simplify and just say it's your job. Like you're playing for a team and like you sh- whether things are going well or badly, you've been paid or whatever, or you're brought there to play football. So if you start down in tools or whatever, psychologically, then like, why are you there? You know, it doesn't matter essentially if you're winning every week or losing every single week, you're still getting the opportunity to play and you still should go out there. And if you end up at the end of the season, not being good enough, whether it's you individually, whether it's you collectively or whatever, or there's bad fortune, then that's whatever it is. Because, you know, try as you might, there are 20 teams every year in the Premier League that pay their players to stay in the Premier League, but three teams every year go down regardless of intent and desire and so on and so forth. You know, you can't escape that fact. But unfortunately, I think some people, they kind of see it like, well, we'll stay up this year because we've got the right desire. But then the, on the flip side of it, people say, well, you didn't, well, you went down because you didn't have desire. Well, maybe you did, but in that instance, maybe you weren't good enough or maybe yeah, something wasn't good enough. Yeah, I mean, quality, luck, like exactly. they, they all play a part for sure, for sure. And confidence as well, because you see some teams like, say, look at the, the two sides of Sheffield United. Yeah. Last season, finished seventh, they were on a roll. They were going everywhere. Everything felt great, could win everything. This year, they have a slow start and now they can't find a win. Before you know it, that month turns into two months turns into three months like it's the different it's the same players yeah. but a different feel yeah and a different outcome when the season's finished but then i wouldn't say they've tried any less this year but they've just not had the things required to be successful like they had the year before mm. fascinating um i i'm desperate to crow by this end just because one thing with jolie and lesco because as soon as i thought about him i thought about uh, that game that would the, the the Aguero game, you know, yes. I was at that game. I was at the Etihad. I've never walked away from a stadium where everyone's happy that much. Yes. It was bizarre. Yes. It was absolutely yes. bizarre. But for you specifically, well, first of all, Julian Lescott makes a mistake. We'll just get out of the way quickly for, yeah. for the first one. I wonder if, was there ever an exchange with him that you could have afterwards? Because of course they won the league. Well, it's funny you say <laughs> that. So myself, that? And, myself and Julian are responsible for three of the goals from that game. <laughs> Really? Because uh, Edin Zeko scored a header over me. And then for their last goal, I had the throw in down the side. And I That's not your fault. No, 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 no. I'm stopping you right now. That fault. is not, no, that is not your not fault. It. My dad goes mad about this, as do I. That is not your fault. No, that is. is the fault it, of, God, who was it? It was either Zamora or Sean Wright Phillips. They didn't no, it was come over. It was Jay Boffroyd. It was Jay Boffroyd. No, no, no. Let no, me, no, no let it's me, not your fault. Me, no, 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 let me add some, let me add some more to it. Let me add some more to it why it was my fault. Let me add some more to it why it was my fault. Falls to me, the history books will show that it didn't matter. So if that game was at Loftus Road, I would have gone to the ball slower. I didn't run to the ball. I cantered out of respect <laughs> to my old team ah. and the old fans. So I probably got there maybe three or four seconds quicker than maybe <laughs> I would have done if we were away. All that gamesmanship would have been a thing, but I was trying to be respectful. Then I said to Jay Buffer, I'm going to throw it down the line, blah, blah, blah. So we lost that. But if someone else on that field is taking that throw in, maybe there's a different outcome. 
but I, I like I played a part in that because I like I said I was the last QPR player to touch it. I was the last QPR player to touch the ball before they scored a goal that could have relegated us. Think about it. Nah, man. Uh, no, okay, yeah, you could slow it down. You could slow it down. But Jay Boffroyd has to come yeah. across to the side, stick Unless his thumb out. I said, he's got I said, to stick said, his thumb out. You've got to hit his chest. He's good at that, but he's good. But he's good at that. He's good at that. But literally, I said it. But there was a miscommunication or whatever. And then, uh, let me be clear: as a player, like especially a defender, you know when a goal is going to be your fault, and you hope that <laughs> yeah, nothing yeah, happens. Yeah. Like it's not always a case if you slip over and someone's through one on one or whatever. You just know when a decision which you made <laughs> <laughs> was a key action. So I'm running back, thinking, please don't score, please yeah. don't score, please. And at no point, that's what, that's what made it like worse for me mm. at no point could I have affected what happened after the throw-in because they never came to my side no. so I'm running back relying on absolutely everybody to make something <laughs> like stop because Mark Hughes for as much as some people disliked him and so on one of the mottos which he had he said most goals come from consecutive mistakes and he said the real skill is being able to see when mistakes are being made and somebody step up and like stop stop right. the action there. So, yeah, like a, like a Fernandinho maybe. Like, someone's gonna exactly, a like game. a foul or make the right decision or whatever, clear the ball, like key, sense it. Oh, that's a mistake. Okay, that's a mistake. This guy's wrong. Okay, let's deal with this right now. And unfortunately, nobody steps up in that moment. <laughs> But, well, that's because we, we were, well, we had 10 men, which is, you know, we're talking about yeah. consecutive mistakes. That's not on yeah. you. And the yeah. other thing, we just got sucked into our yeah. own um, penalty box. Yeah. All right, think, so. I, I've, to be fair, yeah, rightly so. And they were pushing. And, you know, it's, yeah. the ironic thing is for City, as you probably saw yourself, um, before they scored in score to make it 2-2, they were terrible for the 15 minutes before yeah. that. That's probably as worse, that was as bad in terms of like general football, they probably played the whole season. Mm. And that's when the pressure was at their highest. So the importance of that Zerko goal, you know, gives them a little sense of hope. But for us as QPR, there was no desire for us to get up because we, we, we don't, we're not going to step on goal there for us, are we, yeah. or whatever. So, let's, so, let's so I, I missed the Aguero goal. And the reason yeah. I missed the Aguero goal was I was calling, I was calling my mate, Craig, who's uh, the biggest Stoke City fan. And I knew, I could trust that he, as much as all this madness is going down, he's he's watching Stoke City Bolton in a game that means nothing for Stoke. So I'm calling him going, is it over? Is it over? Is I'm screaming, is it over? Because obviously Dzeko scored and I'm just thinking, oh, this is this. I mean, we've kind yeah. of got away with it up till now. Um, but yeah, I can't let you have that, man. I can't let you have Wait, that, man. It's, it's, it's wild. And do you know that, the, so wild. I've had this That's because I'm in my just because I'm in Manchester, I've like I've had to speak about this so much and whatever. I think some people forget that I wasn't playing for City that day. Yeah. But like the thing about how do you QPR, feel about that? Were you okay? Is, yeah, I'm I'm not first. You know, it's this content or whatever. It's what people want to hear. But um, oh, no, the sorry, thing, I mean, how did it feel to play? You know, as a guy. Oh, like, it's, a weird, it's one of the weirdest one of the weirdest weeks and days of my entire life. Not even just my career, but this, oh. from our QPR side, the thing which doesn't get reported enough when that game is discussed. Obviously, our side of it itself, but. The last minute goal by Gibral Cisse the week before against Stoke is the goal that kept us in the Premier League. Mate, that goal is unreal. That, that, doesn't get, oh. that, that was our moment. That was yeah. our moment that season, but that's not part of the conversation. Yeah. I keep having to say, you know, we didn't stay up because like they forget that we lost the game. Yeah. Like, no, no, we, we didn't get any points from that. So we did stay up because of the emotion of the last minute goal. And even to add to that, Gibral scored. And remember, so they had Dilap at the time. Yeah. But he had yeah. shoulder. He had like really bad. His shoulders were sore. <laughs> so in the last minute of the game, he's like winding up to take a big throw into the box, but he couldn't. He tried to do it forty yards. He went about ten. Oh, right. but just, so everything just fell in our favor yeah. in that moment. Ultimately, like I say, that's that's the game that kept us up, not the City game. I mean, yeah. I mean, but that run of games as well. We played Liverpool, mm -hmm. Arsenal, Spurs. I think we beat all three of those guys before right. beating Stoke. That's right. Yeah. That was that's right, yeah. Right, wait, this is going to go on forever, bud. I know you've got other things you got. Yeah, to do. I know. I'm I sorry, I'm just, sorry. Oh, no, mate. But I can literally chat for hours with you, mate. This is amazing. Uh, let's move on to your other centre-back, which is uh, we get to talk about the playoff final now. Um, yeah. So. yeah. Give us your other centre-back, who, of course, you play with, you know, you know, he's got that Man City connection and, of course, QPR as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Richard Dunn's my other centre-back and he's somebody where, when I was a youngster coming through at City, so it was this was tough because it was him and Sylvain Distan who were exceptional as players for City in that time, to the point where their importance to the club was similar, say midway through, the, as to this midway through the season when people were talking about Stones and Diaz or like in the past when it was company and Lescott, like those, 
were an iconic centre back pairing for me because they were so good. You know, the team was nowhere near as good as it is now, but they mattered just as much in that team as others because their level of performance and the the way they carried themselves and so on. It was it was brilliant. And they were there at the time where academy players were just literally coming in through the door the whole time. But they made us all feel incredibly welcome. And they were in, like, abs- I think they were flip-flop between being captain or being player of the year. Like as far as role models go, they were they were outstanding. So you could either follow them, follow the way they were on the field, or you could follow the way they were off the field. But they showed you what it was to play for the club. Someone like Richard Dunn was... You know, he, he always, always played well. He was one of the most underrated players, I think, in the Premier League. He was, you know, the guy was joke good and to play alongside him, even at right back or whatever. That was a dream. And then when he came to QPR, like he was obviously a bit older, but again, so the confidence good. you have when when I was playing alongside someone like him, like that, champ, the, the championship, uh, the playoff final, mm. that's one of the best games he's played. And it was like just normal. To see him, it's like, well, I wasn't even surprised because I'd seen him for the years before that. And he stepped up and he's just, he can just dominate. He knows the game so well. He's had one of the best blocks I've ever seen in my life. I think it was one against Everton uh, when he was at City. And Andrew, Andrew Johnson, former QPR player, tried to hit a shot in the bottom corner and Rich was laying on the floor, chested it away. It's like one of the best things I've ever seen. Yeah. But, that, but, that's, but that's Richard Dunn. Yeah. And as I say, What's as a it, human being. So as a player, you know, 515 games I've got here. 80 caps for, for Ireland, captain of Ireland, captain of, of Manchester City, captain of Aston Villa, captain of Queen's Park Rangers. I don't know if he's captain of Everton or not. He probably should have been. Mm. With me, so the thing that I, I go to with him, and I'd love to know a little bit more on, because I feel like, first of all, he's like bulletproof. You know, like so yeah. like goalkeepers are going, like, yeah. the, the further you go up the field, the more you're like, ah, don't, don't kick it at me. Whereas Richard Dunn's yeah. like, go on then. He yeah. sort of had that he, about him. He was better on the ball that he got credit for. Yes, and the thing fair. that I've got to say about him is that I think it, it might have been a season we... I think it was a season we went down. Rio Ferdinand came in. Um, and I was... We, we were very unfortunate because... And of course, there were other things at play. But w- the first game of the season, we played whole City. We played three centre-backs, I think. And mm-hmm. we played Ali Fowlin in front with Joey Barton. And we, we played great football. Lost to a, a, a set piece from James Chester, I think. Um, mm-hmm. Then after that, quite quickly, Harry Redknapp kind of panicked because... I think he panicked a little bit because Ali Fowling got injured. And just, I, I'm guessing, but I felt like you couldn't play this like kind of continental after the World Cup passing style that would have suited someone like Rio Ferdinand in the team. So quite quickly, we went back to a to a back four. And what I remember about in terms of Richard Dunn that season was that as much as we were excited about Rio Ferdinand, and of course, Rio Ferdinand was going through a lot that season. As soon as Rio Ferdinand came out and Richard Dunn came in, the difference was frightening. And people yeah. will never kind of believe that. And often mm-hmm. with, I said this in, uh, when I chatted to Ben Foster last week, there are players that play for Premier League teams that are maybe down the bottom. They just do not get the credit they deserve because of the clubs or the situations that they're playing in. Richard Dunn in the season where we went down, he was he kept the score down a lot of the time. He was unbelievable <laughs> yeah. for us. Such yeah. a good player. Yeah, for sure. But- the, the the whole credit situation, I think it's one whereby from the outside, I think so, certain people do not get it. But within the building, if you play with them, you, you understand exactly who's who. Like if you were to go around asking players at teams, if you were playing a five aside, who your first pick is, mm. you, probably 70% of the time they'll say someone who you never would have even expected. Yeah. Because there's certain players who have that sense of importance to a side. Are there a couple know, that come to mind for you? I'd love to know just off the top of your head. Um, so... To talk about, say, when I was City, you're talking about like Gareth Barry's early doors, like book it in. Even though he's surrounded by David Silvers, Tevez's and all that, Gareth Barry, lock it in, mate. Lock it in. Um, <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, who else was there? Who else would I say? Um, do you know, I can't think of the top, man, because yes, it was tough. a long, long career. But as I say, there are lots of players like that who you know are, like Richard Dunn as well, you know what I mean? Like, you wouldn't be thinking, oh, I definitely need this. But those people make a huge difference. And to talk about how robust he was. So me playing right back when he was playing centre back, I was out at right back for longer than probably was intended because he was playing centre back. Yeah. And Richard Dunn, unless his leg's actually fallen off, he's going to go and play in the game. And it was the same with Silva and Distan. And I 
picked that up from them to the point whereby I would always, always, always do everything I could to play for the team, even if I wasn't 100%. Mm. Sometimes it'd be to, to my own detriment and whatever, but I didn't care because I wanted to be somebody who could be relied upon in the same way that they were. And I think as years gone by, there's this thing with centre-backs where, you know, they'll go down in the game, they'll be like thinking, oh, I'm feeling a bit this, feeling a bit, oh, my back's a bit sore. But for them, it made no difference. And I think that level of reliability is why I say most of the people who I've played with, if not all, you know, they did feel that they could rely on me. And ultimately, if someone was on the bench to cover me, they didn't have to warm up very often because they knew like, the only reason I'm coming off this pitch is because I'm, I'm basically dying. Yeah. You know, that, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, that I think with, with Richard away. Dunn, the one comparison I did want to make with, with him and yourself is, I think there's sometimes there are players that you don't, you don't realise how good they are till they're not there anymore. Mm. And that's certainly certainly with you, like, uh, there's a lot of QPR players that I'm angry that didn't either didn't get the the goodbye that they deserved, like Sir Clint Hill, Nally Fowlin, yeah. with Jimmy, Floyd Hasselbank, and I guess that's not totally on him, but whatever. But also with yourself, like you have like you, you should still be playing in my head, right? And so that's, and that's what a couple of years ago now. So for you to walk yeah. away when you went, I was like, what have we done here? Why have we not no. looked this literally there? We could have had him. Yeah, the that was a that was a very complex saga and so on. Mm. But to be honest, as I was leaving, I remember it was the last game of the season, the last home game of the season, and the fans were shouting chief as I was walking around the field giving a giving a clap. And that there felt like the vindication because for the as I say, for the six and a half years I gave everything I could to the club. There were times when I was playing well, times when maybe I wasn't or whatever, but I stuck it out through the good times, the bad times. And I helped, I basically, I was tasked with helping the club transition towards younger players in the three years that I was captain. Yeah, And I think you could speak to all those younger players and know that I always had their best intentions at heart with everything that I was trying to do for them, whether it was protecting them when the team wasn't doing well, because the expectation was still high. When I became captain, the expectation was still high, but the sort of age level of the team was a lot lower. And I was getting all types of abuse about this, about that. People saying I'm a poor captain and so on and so forth, but they didn't understand the role of captain in the bigger picture, especially in the different type of playing force. Because they want, they were used to say certain people or whatever in the past who would just be ranting and raving, shouting and screaming on the field. But that stuff there is performative. It doesn't... Okay. The people who gain the most respect from players tend to be the ones who lead by example not by shouting and criticism because not only is football different, the world is different now. The younger generation is coming up behind us. They respond differently to the way, say some of the things that brought the best out of you and I, mm. you know, when we were younger, it's a completely different world. Yeah. And I think I, I helped be a part of that alongside others as well. You know, we're talking about James Purchase, like Smithies and stuff who were a bit older at the time, but I, I helped nurture some of those people and, you know, try and teach them what it is to play football. Because I think um, as far as football goes, I think your legacy, even though you could be successful with a club, but the longer you spend there, I think, especially being around younger players, if I can teach them, help them learn lessons earlier than I did myself, it gives them opportunity to have a better career than I had myself sure. or to be better players than I was myself. And as a consequence, I think that sh that's something which I would celebrate more than medals themselves. Because ultimately, as I say, I could be there and I could be very, very selfish, but that was never my goal. And as I say, the, the talent, Football continues after someone retires. So don't try and carry on like the game ends when you stop. And I think with those players, you're looking at, say, people who are close to. And so I think I brought the best out at QPR. You're looking at Bere as a, you're looking at Ilyash, uh, Bright Say right. Samuel, who's in Turkey, um, uh, Osman Kakai, Nico Hamalain, and just to name but a few. And the way I did that was we always used to play Young v Old under Ian Holloway. And I used to press them, grill them, grill them, jab them, jab them every time we won, jab them. And it, they got more and more hot and hostile about it. And those games meant everything to them. Right. And then right. they had got this sort of like winning spirit, winning desire and stuff like that. And they didn't realize at the time, but that was me trying to get them to raise their level and understand what it's required to beat professionals. But then lo and behold, if they could ended up beating us, then they'd be going into the weekend more confident yeah. because they're playing against people like us on a week to week basis. And they're, they're very, very confident because they were skilled players, but they just needed that little bit extra. And I think I yeah, helped them get a little bit extra. And now they're, they're all cracking on, it looks like. That's amazing. It's, it's interesting. There's like, you know, it, I didn't think of kind of leadership as an element of parenting, but it almost kind of sounds like, you know, cause you it's, know, you can almost poke the beast a little bit cause you understand it's for their, for their benefit. Yeah. Is it, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say specifically parenting because, you know, these guys can look after themselves anyway, but sure. it's just certain it's decisions. Though, right? it's yeah, fatherly though, right? Yeah, I like the fact that they can all come to me and some of them do come and speak to me still now. 
but it's understanding, like say this manager probably doesn't like you doing this, even though doing this yeah. feels like the right thing to do. Yeah. You know, every manager is ultimately different. There are some who like you to go and knock on their door and there are some who are a knock at the door and they hold it against you. Right. There are some who sort of like, as far as football goes as well, trust is a huge thing. And if someone can trust you to work hard, that's the foundation, not the fact they can trust you to score a goal. Because as a youngster, people are very quick to write you off. So don't provide them with the opportunity to do so. So yeah, you're good at scoring free kicks, but make sure you come back every time you have to in a five-a-side. And that will carry you a lot further than that possible Galazzo or whatever that you score, which means more to you in your generation. Yeah. You know, that type of thing. And it's just, and it, it made a difference because I'd say, I think- You could see, you could see that. Yeah, players are supposed to get better, yeah. And, and you know, I could say, you could say someone like, um, and it's funny when you talk about, say, both Bright and, and uh, Abire, you saw them in that kind of first year or the back end of, of Holloway's first year. And they, they, they were good, but they were, they were bad decisions at times. And then I yeah. think that year after for both of them, you just saw a kind of, yeah, it was, it was the decision making in particular that was mm. really, really different. Final thing I want to say actually about the, the uh, QPR fans as well is that, you know, you get to talk about intent of footballers. There are some really stupid football fans. And unfortunately, a lot of them are, are loud as well. So <laughs> as, as from one QPR fan to a, to a player, mate, please understand that we, I think we saw what you were as a captain and you were a very nah. good captain as well, mate. So just, just so you know. I think, I think we've, I, that stuff doesn't bother me anyway, because I think for my, it my bothers value, me though, mate, it bothers me. Nah, because my, uh, I think yeah. if, if I'm respected by my teammates and by my manager, ultimately that is the biggest sort of sign of approval compared to say the fan side of things because there have been plenty of players who fans don't like who players do trust and rely on 100 percent. and then ultimately as you said there like some of the naysayers are the loudest so it seems like that's the only sound but as you get older you realize no they're just the loudest and for some people like how do you counter it if someone says oh yeah you're a rubbish this or you're a crap that is someone going to say no he's not yeah. no you're not you're really good like that's not that's not <laughs> going to be a thing is that so the impersonation of me the, yes yeah. exactly that's, that's impersonation, impersonation of you but, yeah, but if you don't like you're not you don't expect to hear that but you know mm -hmm. like i say just because people are saying one thing doesn't mean that more people aren't saying another, exactly. but it's just a weird thing to say out loud yeah. if to, count, to contradict it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, playing at Loftus Road, I guess you've got to get some thick, thick skin pretty quickly, right? A uh, whole, oh, yes, indeed. But also, <laughs> it works both ways because yeah. then when things are going well, that's one of the best places to play. Some of the some of my best memories in my career have been there. Totally. Uh, so talking to leadership, we move into your <laughs> midfield and, and a player that you probably... People wouldn't Hang expect. You've got a left back, or you're, oh, good. you're gonna... I've got a left back. I've done this before. I did this last time. Have I? Let me just bring you back in. Yeah, yeah. This cliche at left back. Oh, sorry, babe. Sorry. Go on, go yeah. for it. Uh, so, so yeah, Gail cliche in the same sort of breath when I speak about Julian Lescott in terms of level of professionalism and so on is somebody who is right up there. This is a guy who's still playing now, and he's playing to the best of his abilities. He's playing really, really well, and he was somebody who, you know, for the success that City had in the past. He didn't, you could say there was a bit of a toss up between him and Alexander Kolarov. But Gail Cliche is somebody who was at Arsenal, someone who came through seeing the Invincibles. I think he, he might have been on the bench a few times for that year. So he's played with some of the very, very best. And this is a guy who you love to play with. That level of reliability, that love for the game, that level of understanding. And, you know, at times, like there'll be times in my career where I'll be honest, like I might have struggled mentally with certain things. But from back when, you just remain on an island, but he's somebody who tries to bring everybody in, understands how the youth work and understands that, you know, it's, even though it's, you're an individual within a team, everybody performing well as a team helps every individual. Mm -hmm. So he, as I say, would be looking out for you, looking out for you and caring for you, not just from the perspective of like, if you're scoring goals, they could see when maybe you're outside of the team and maybe you should be in the team. He'll talk to you then, you know, he'll, he'll probably talk to you more, when you when you're down then say come and pat you on the back when you're doing something great like he'll acknowledge the greatness but he understands because he's been on every side of it he's been outside of the team he's been outside of the bench and the squads but he knows people's values and he always tries to get the best out of everybody because then you know it makes his job easier as well because he's one of the best of the best so Gail Cliche for me is like what a guy what a human what a player yeah sounds like he's got and it sounds like there's a bit of a theme here in terms of communication feels like it's important to you standards feels like it's important yeah. to you and maybe it's like Gail cliche not someone i would obviously don't know too no. much about aside from his playing style but like it, did he it seemed, sounds like he had a real emotional intelligence about him. yeah for sure for sure like the way that 
the game can be played. You can do it in one of many ways, but there are people, as I say, who try to be the very best version that they can be. And he's somebody who's also honest because when I spoke about spoke with him on my podcast, one of the things he said, because I said, well, how can you be winning this in England, winning that in England, being part of the Arsenal team and so on and not play for France? And he said, well, because we had this person ahead of me, because we had that person ahead of me. And he acknowledges how great those players were themselves. Mm-hmm. So yes, he was part of a conversation, but he knows where he knows his place and his position. He never gets ahead of himself. And as far as football goes, when you do find a level of success, there are lots of players who then start to just, you know, they just, they lose all sight, all sort of level of perception and say, well, I should be this. I should be that. But he was never somebody who says, I should be this and should be that. He said he was going to work to the best of his abilities and whatever would come would come. And if mm-hmm. it didn't come, he would not be upset because he still did everything that he could to make it happen. Wow. Because you can't, as I say, you can't, you can't necessarily pick yourself for any team or sway opinion and so on like that, but you can give, but within football very quickly, you can give people reasons to not pick you. But throughout his whole career, he has never done that. And he's someone, as I say, as a template, it's just, it's a flawless model, in my opinion, of somebody who wants to, uh, who wants to be the best that they can be in football. Yeah, and sounds like someone who stays, stays present, which because I guess yeah. you can, that's, you know, we all have that in life. You can kind of go, you can have a look too far back or look to, you're know, looking at what you should yeah. be getting or could be getting. It sounds like he, he was able to stay pretty level, which is yeah. very wise. And that's, and for me, that's one of the big mantras in terms of me and my career. So I've had lots of highs, I've had some lows and so on, but I don't watch back goals that I've scored, for example, because it's just on to the next one, mm-hmm. because then you can get caught in that moment. If you spend an hour watching it, something, watching something good that you did, how does it, feel when the next week you don't do something good and you choose to ignore it you know i like to remain consistent yeah and the game is done if there's something to learn from it you learn from it but if there's not you go on to the next and get ready for it because ultimately like i say from from when you start playing football there are a lot a lot of people who think well when you score a goal great goal one week people think they're going to show on tv till the end of time but ultimately nah (laughs) they move on so it's probably time you should do too okay Uh, let's move into midfield and i guess i'll give you a question which will lead you into being able to talk about this next pick Who's your captain in this team? Oh, I've got I've got a ton of captains. I <laughs> know. Um, uh, I for seniority, I'm gonna have to go for Richard Dunn. I thought you might, but but there are a couple of iconic captains in there. One of them being this next guy, who is Vincent Company, and he's playing the six. So Vincent was somebody, uh, which some maybe some people have forgotten now, but when he actually signed for City, he was a holding midfielder. It was him and Nigel De Jong who were the two sixes for City. And I remember the year before he came, I actually, I was in Hamburg. So he was playing in Hamburg and I went to visit him because we have a mutual friend. Yeah, wow. And he was actually playing on the Hamburg team and he was number 10. Really? Like literally he had the number 10 on his back and he, yeah. the team I think was Nigel Jong holding and it was, I think it was, I think it was Vinny and uh, Raphael van der Vaart who were the high eights. And I remember seeing him doing step overs, having shots and all this stuff. And that was like, that was the Vincent company that I first encountered. Wow. Was know, he more he slender a, then? No, nah, well, yes and no. Yes and no. I'm like to picture he's, him. He's, listen, he was he was the same height. He was just as aggressive, but he was playing further up the field. Because one thing that gets disregarded is like he was exceptionally good on the ball. Mm-hmm. He was like that whole sort of like Benelux type foot roll thing, you know, move the ball this way, control it like that, you know, that whole technically sound whatever type setup. And as I say, he was playing in Germany in that sort of higher eight position. But then he came to City and it was a hold, it was a holder. And when he came. Like, I'd, you know, most people had probably seen him on, um, like, what's it called now? The football, uh, fantasy, not fantasy football, the football manager. Football manager. Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. like a huge prospect and stuff like that. And he came in and he was so significant because he was a change in direction in terms of people that we'd been buying beforehand. Because we'd bought plenty of good players at City at that point. But, you know, there was a step up in sort of talent and potential because here was essentially a younger player being brought in who was playing for the national team and so on and was a, was like a huge type prospect he was coming in and he was like he was Vinny was tough Vinny sorry Vinny is tough he's a tough player to be playing against he's somebody who in that central midfielder when he was like fully fit because again there's another side to him where he for probably two three months in his time they had like I think he had a broken toe and he was playing with it I remember one time specifically we were at the Emirates and he cut a hole in the side of his boot and his toe was just sticking out the side and whatever. But that's 
you know, he'd do anything to be out there on the field to participate and try and do everything he could for the team. So he was he was a good, very good defensive midfielder for City because he was one of the best that would ever sign at that point. And his influence on the team, influence in the city, influence in the dressing room started to really come through. Like the Vinny company who left City was different to the one at the start. But the one at the start had the same principles, but had no foundation at the club. But that foundation, which he laid when he first came in, was exceptional. And, you know, like I say, most people see him as a centre-back and he did exceptionally well there. But I remember, I think, the first big game when he went there, we were playing against Wigan. Was it Wigan? Oh, we're playing, I think it might have been Wigan, actually. We were playing a game at home and somebody got sent off and he had to get put back there. And he got put back there when I was playing in the game. And one of the biggest compliments looking back I had was he said, well, when I went back there, I can't. He said, "I can't thank you enough because you made it really easy for me." Is what Vincent Company said to me. Uh, Little uh, did I know, him going back there would be the end of my City career. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, looking, but like I say, he. Uh, yeah, there wasn't a moment where you looked to yourself and went, "Shit." <laughs> <laughs> no, that was shortly after. But he, but he did that, and he became. He accepted that was going to be his position, and he's obviously done very, very well there. But beforehand, he was a six, and he's definitely somebody who, at his peak, could play that position very, very well. Yeah. And, you know, those two other two centre-backs in there, you know, he's, you could argue he's, he's better than those two or whatever, but just to have him in the team is something special. And as I say, to see him have, have pre- previously played that position, yeah, I think I just I just threw him in there to just confuse people. Yeah, no, I like it. I think, I mean, with him, I think he to have the career he had with the injuries that he had, it was just, he made it undeniable. I think with his, mm. with his attitude and application, like he, he never kind of seemed to give up on the fact that he was going to come back and finish it the way that he wanted. And, and, and obviously okay. did finish it the way that he wanted. I mean, that goal, talk about goal. You don't want to look at goals too much, but I'll tell you what, I've happily watched that Vincent company goal it, again and again. It's the importance of it. That goal, I think it was against Leicester because City weren't playing well that day. And he yeah. scored that goal um, after being told by Gundogan, I think it was, to not shoot. But he shot anyway. But he scored some very big goals because I think he scored a header against Man United in a yeah. derby a few years earlier as well, which really mattered. But Carling Cup final was not or League Cup. Uh, or yeah, so he's someone, as I say, who thrives on the biggest occasions and he sets the standard and he will not break away from them like he... Uh, in a preseason one time, we were playing against Inter Milan, I think it was. And I think Samuel Leto might have been playing up front. And Vinny was kicking him for the whole first half to the point where the Torre brothers were trying to tell him, could you like calm down a bit? It's a preseason game, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Vinny said, nah, I'm all right. And he said, <laughs> I said to her too, he said, every time you complain, I'll kick you again. And he was a man of his word. And every time he complained, he kicked him over and over and over. And this yeah, was a preseason yeah. game against one of the icons of like world football and specifically African football. Yeah. Did he care? Not one bit. Amazing. And yeah, interesting players that kind of move position. Like, I didn't know that about Micah Richards in terms of being, being a centre midfielder mm-hmm. yourself as well and, and Vincent Company as well. I think there's there's often a lot of there's a lot of good that can come from that. It's certainly players that kind of move backwards. Like I think I, yeah. I think of Ashley Cole as well as a, as a winger who kind of moved back. wan Saka for the younger yeah. um, uh, watchers as well. Um, yeah, I think also the last thing I would say on, on Vincent Company is the fact that he was like the first elite sort of pre-peak player, if that makes sense. We get a player yeah. who was like, who, and Matt, like you say, with the players that you were bringing in, they it weren't they weren't finished or or, or yeah. something. But there was some sort of like there was something yeah. that wasn't totally right with him, and you know, and other players that we're going to talk about in a second. Um, you could tell that he was, you know, but had both potential and years on his side. Yeah, his, exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, let's move to a uh, another midfielder then. Um, let's go with again a, a player who, you know, you played with at, at, at the start of your career, and someone who again is has misconceptions about him. Yeah, he does. Yeah, uh, but just to close, just to put a bow on the Vincent Company thing, yeah. we talked about yeah. injuries and so on. But those injuries were something which came later in his Man City time, and I think before that, you know, this was a guy who was around. It was he was there all the time, and I felt bad for him in that spot where he was injured because, like, as I say, you couldn't you couldn't rewrite his legacy. But every time he was injured, it was funny because his reputation got higher and higher because they couldn't have they couldn't bring anybody in to replace him in that spell who had the same influence but yeah the other player anyway in midfield in one of the eights is Stephen Ireland so he was in my academy team I think from the age of 14 and in fact it might have been 15 I remember we uh we were starting pre-season one time we were doing some like keep up things and he came and he just remember just caught the ball on his foot mid-air and I thought that's the first time I've seen that in the academy and then he was playing a position where he was more of a 10 like the, the two turns I remember from academy football, because at the time everything was a 4-4-2. Right. It was him right. and it was Giuseppe Rossi. And they were both like 
different. They were just, they were different, completely different. And Stevie's one of those guys where, like, when he was at his peak for City, he was as good as anybody. I think he might have been player of the season the year when we were, well, when under Mark Hughes, I think, when we went into the Europa League and got to the quarterfinals. But that was a team which had talent. I think maybe Alano was there and so on and so forth. So there were people who on paper should have been a bigger deal. But he was invaluable. And I think that started where, at the start of the year, I think they were trying to send him to Sunderland or something like that on a on loan. But Stevie stepped up in that moment. And his talent level, for me, is still undoubted now. Like, he's, I don't know if he's retired or not or whatever, because he's had some bad injuries over the past few years. Yeah. But honestly, when he was at his best, I saw it in the academy level. I saw it in the Premier League level. Like he's he's special. He's special, but he's one of those underrated ones. And in fact, he'd be somebody where if you were playing a five aside and some or so on, I'd imagine most players he's played with would have him in the first one within the top three picks guaranteed. But you never would have thought so. But in those games, I remember like we played this is something that was really good at. When we beat United in the I forget which year it was. It was at Old Trafford and it was in the game to commemorate the Munich disaster. Yeah. I remember Rio Ferdinand was playing. And he must have given Stevie the ball seven, eight times because Stevie's the best at reading where the ball's going to go. He plays so dumb. He'd just be standing there like, I'm oblivious. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Put your head down. You play it. He's there. He's not running at you. Picks the right pass. Done. And Rio got to the point where he's like double and triple bluffing himself. He's trying to do like a no look reverse pass and then say, well, maybe if I just look and do it there. And that was like... Obviously, Real Ferdinand's one of the best that's ever played the game. But in that particular game there, I think Steve was literally living his head rent free. And I and I loved it. And he's the only player I've seen do that. So he's an exceptional talent. And I say, and I saw it from academy times all the way through to the peak in his career. I, my thoughts on Stephen Ireland is, yeah, like you say, like the, the talent was clear. Like, and I think it's that when you watch football games, certain players do certain things where you go, oh, it just sort of like mm. shocks you a little bit. And I yeah. think with his dribbling ability... Um, vision as well, really great vision. Um, and I, was, I alluded to two, two mentions from my mate who's a Stoke fan. Uh, he, we've we've had chats about Stephen Ireland because it's a kind of there's a lot of sort of what ifs within that, right? 138 yeah. games for Man City, 16 yeah. goals, 47 games for Aston Villa. He's on loan at Newcastle, got two games. Yeah. Stoke City, thir- only th- uh, 13 games on loan, sorry, and then yeah. 46 games once he went there. Mark Hughes quite liked him, it seemed. Yeah, he did. Um, yeah. But what was it? Was it injuries? Was it? Was there a sort of an attitude or, or psychological no. element to any of this? Because um, it seems strange that he didn't have, you know, didn't play more games, didn't have a better career. Than yeah, I, I'm, I'm the same as you because for his talent level, he was exceptional. And he is, you probably will go down and look back and say, what if? Because I think at times, because he doesn't speak up in terms of being really aggressive, saying, well, I should be playing, I should be this, I should be that you kind of become the person who's easy to drop because you could be dropped and not. And it's, it's annoying. To be a team player sometimes weakens you because you can be yeah. dropped and not make a big fuss about it. But there are players who were dropped and now there's the most drama in the world ever. So some managers, if they can't get them out, they have to put them into the team. They keep put them back in the team. Mm, it's not worth the hassle. But, no, exactly. Yeah. But Stevie was, was the exact opposite of that. As I say, he was a great team player. He had one or two injuries and so on or whatever. But then also in terms of like, I would say timing can be a thing as well. Mm. Because I think the the when he came out, he probably would have been better if he was coming out of City maybe a few years later and so on, because his skill level, his talent level was different to what we had at the time. And we used to have debates, was it Stevie or Michael Johnson who's better and this stuff and blah, blah, blah. I think Stevie ended up lasting longer. But you know, we talk about the importance of certain things like ability levels and so on in football, or time is also an issue because you look, for example, at Man City. I bet you couldn't tell me more than maybe five academy strikers who've come through at Man City in the 10 years where Sergio Aguero has been there. Yeah. But that's not because it's not necessarily been good enough. It's been because Sergio Aguero has been there. So that's the time, that's the description of timing. And for Stevie, say he was in at City from a younger age. And then as the club was trying to go on the way up, you know, they start investing more in different types of attackers who maybe suit the eye a bit more. Mm. So then he goes on loan to one place and he goes to another place. The club's doing well, not doing so well, they're struggling. And then he goes to the next place. There's a bit of a struggle, but now he's got he's got injuries and stuff and now people are playing ahead of him and so on and so forth. So I'm not trying to make excuses for him. No, I think I that's a fair one because I think the fact is, is that, you know, when money comes in, mm-hmm. you're going to go, they're going to go, right, we've, we've turned up, we want to spend some cash. Where are we going to spend cash? Attacking midfield striker yeah like it's those yeah. sort of sexy positions that you're going to yeah. do that so someone like Steven Ireland it's, it's going to be it's going to be tough for him 
Yeah, hundred percent. And I think with Stevie as well, the um, it's like the his best vision is probably in an eight or a ten, but they don't see him as a glamour enough, glamorous enough sort of eight or a ten. Or you end up at a club like Stoke, where a ten isn't really a ten ten, if you know what yeah. I mean. They're more like a maybe they were more of a four four two and so on and so forth. But like I say, in terms of talent, he was right up there, and I saw him get close to his peak, and he it was it was special. And he's somebody who, as I say, would be slept on by many, but I guarantee he'd give you one of the toughest games you've ever had because he was that good. Yeah, and and also you know Republic of Ireland only six caps for for Republic of Ireland for one of his talents. It's, it's embarrassing <laughs> to be honest. I don't really understand how that happened. Work. That's it. That's the kind of worms which are. Uh, yes, we'll I know, to, I know it is. But yeah. Yeah, the fact remains, though, that you know, in they were able to get two tournaments, and I tell you, just just one of those players with uh, around a very sturdy team could have made a bit of a difference for for them. So so sad, so sad they wasn't able to do that. Um, we move into. I'm trying to keep up with this formation. So we, you had you had Vincent Company sitting. So you got two eights, haven't you? Yes. Okay. Yes. Let's uh, let's have your second eight then. So the second eight is David Silva. So David Silva, I I didn't play for years and years with him, but I think I played for maybe a year and a half, possibly more. And he was somebody who I saw at, come through that Valencia system where they were, you know, the same system that brought like a matter, you know, they were like, they were just creating these these freakishly good left-footed whatever players and stuff. And at City, I haven't been, in, been at the point where we first came through and, they were, they were buying players who were maybe 35 years old plus who maybe have another year left in them and so on, you know, who did have value. But that was the sort of the buying policy. So then all of a sudden seeing someone like a David Silva get brought in to try and push the team on and create, be part of this project. I thought, wow, okay, this guy's, this guy's, this guy's all right. And then we doing <laughs> like run runs and stuff. I was like, no, this, this guy's, this guy's, this guy's really, really good. This guy's really, really good. <laughs> And then you saw very quickly, like his talent level was exceptional, mm. but so was his work ethic. And the thing which I loved about him the most, he's probably one of the most unnecessarily humble players you'll ever come across. So usually with the, the attack of all the talent might have a little bit of a, you know, winking at you, giving it, you know, it's got a bit of posture and so on, but he was never that. He, he might be wearing a, I think there was a time we were celebrating someone's birthday party, someone's birthday, and he was wearing, I think he was wearing a watch. And then you'd be like, oh, that's a nice watch. And you might say, oh, what is it? And whatever. And he'll like shyly say, oh, I got this for, um, for winning the World Cup. You know, <laughs> but he's not going around showing you, look at my watch. I got this for winning the World Cup. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah yes, and he's all begrudgingly yeah. he'll answer the question because he, he's so exactly, sweet. Yeah. And to, to sum up again, like speaking to Joe Hart about him, um, he said, so David Silva's done some of the nicest things in terms, on the pitch that you've probably ever seen, like a volley here, pass there, positioning, move the ball, so on and so forth. But the thing Joe said that he'll, he'll be most passionate about when he talks about himself from a game are when he wins headers and makes tackles. <laughs> really? David Silva. Yeah. Oh, so he's, even though, like I say, he'll do something incredible and you'll be like, oh, that's like the best ball I've ever seen. He'll come and say, oh, but did you see that? He said, did you see what? Did you see what I want to head at the back post? That's and amazing. then that's what, exactly. But that's the type of energy which brings you joy because you know that they're better yeah. than you, but they're not concerned with continually going around and trying to say, well, I'm this and I'm that and I'm whatever. They just want to be part of the team and they know being part of the team is like, yeah, doing something which you don't expect from them you want a header and like, let's all celebrate that together. And that's, that's special one as well to describe one moment I had with him as well. We're playing in a game and uh, this is very early doors when he was there and he was coming towards me to get the ball and there was somebody right on his back. So I didn't play it to him and I went elsewhere. And then afterwards he said, Oh no, no, listen, like just give me the ball. I said, but there was someone there. And he said, well, yeah, that's when I want the ball. So if you see me and somebody's on me, that's when I want the ball because that's when he manipulates it and does whatever. And he was probably the first person I played with who would be like that because usually someone's on them and they'll be like no, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah oh mate I've been there. <laughs> yeah but that was like a different level of talent and perception about the game itself yeah. which I, I hadn't seen before and he became that and now they've basically got a team full of players just like that mm. fluency like it's so fluent that it was like just give me I'm not really concerned about this guy just give yeah, me yeah that's, that's part of the ploy that's part of the ploy you, he comes here I'll do this and then we'll be clean and before you know it three doing steps that ahead every, right I think yeah. what I love about that is for, for that kind of player, do you think normally they need an ego? Surely, 
like to, to kind of retain uh, an element of confidence. But is it? I feel like it's unique for him to have zero ego. And if anything, it sounds like because I think when we all talk about him, he he was sort of a giver, wasn't he? Kind of like yeah. I'll have it, and then okay, you can have it here, you can have it on a plate here. I'll make your life yeah. easier. Like we were we were talking about before we started. Um, Ali Fowlin, one of my favorite player, well, my favorite player of all time, and and he kind of he made the fullbacks look better. Because yeah. whenever they're in trouble, he just sort of trot over and go, "Yeah, I'll have it," and it made, yeah. made their lives easier. Do you think his lack of ego made almost made him a better player? Um, yeah, I would say so. I would say so because you, he then became very, very reliable. Not every game is going to be suited to like an eight or a ten having an exceptional match, but then he would always pull the other way as well. You know, there are some sort of attacking players who, when things aren't going the way, they'll start stropping and so on and so forth. But for him, he knew his value to the team in both directions. And he knew what was required to get the best out of everybody. Mm. And he knows obviously what makes him great as well. But for, if you're making the right sort of decisions or whatever, like he knows, I think for him, the humility comes from knowing the fact that he looks better if other people around him are better as well. You know, so if he's doing everything that he can to make other people better, it makes his game look even better. And you don't need to give him a pat on the back for him being where he is because ultimately he sees it differently. And I think... Uh, so I've, I've played power league and stuff since I've retired and it's, it's an interesting experience. But when I speak, when I spoke to Joe and Lescott about it and I'm saying like some guy was trying to kick me, but like I saw it five years ago. So I just moved out the way and whatever. He said the best way to describe that feeling, that's probably how David Silver felt when he was playing in England with us. So he's seeing things and feeling things that are sort of like Neo type level from Matrix yeah. or whatever. And that's, yeah, and I thought that's that's really incredible because there I was thinking I was a good player, but he's seeing me in the same way. I see someone who, who literally only plays power leagues in yeah. once a week and is, uh, isn't very good at it. Wow. Great choice. Uh, okay, we move forward to your front three. Uh, let's let's start off. Let's start off with the player that I, I have a real uh, burning question on because, okay, it's, I'll say it. It's Sean Wright Phillips is, is one, of your, one of your picks. And yeah. I, I'm going to kind of fast forward and then we can maybe go back to, to his time in Man City because obviously he played a lot of games for Man City, played for England, played for Chelsea. Unbelievable career. From a QPR perspective, this is a selfish question, but just bear with me. He turned up at the same time as you, didn't he? I think in the uh, same he, window. He was, no, he was, uh, I think he was start of the season. I came uh, I came in January. Oh, sorry. sorry all, my bad. Yeah. Um, so he, he arrived and his first couple of games for us, it was... It was like, how have we signed this guy? How on earth mm. have we got a hold of this guy? Um, and, and for about three or four games, he was stunning. And then I, I, I pinpoint it to, there was a game where he scored this almost like Van Basten-like volley against, I think it was West Brom. And it got, um, it got sort of um, taken away for, for offside. And then from that kind of moment, he hadn't scored yet. And then the games build and build and he still hasn't scored and he still hasn't scored and kind of from that point on he'd kind of reached this really high watermark but then it just completely fell away f for him at QPR and I could never mm. understand why that happened because I'd seen at Loftus Road how good he was yeah and and it kind of just unraveled for him can you I think like me on that uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I think as far as the QPR situation would go, I think there were lots of players who were signed who had a very significant name, but they weren't at their peak of their powers anyway. So mm -hmm. in terms of consistent level of really, really high performance, I don't think the club was in a position where they could get players like that because otherwise it'd be buying players for 10, 20, 30, 40 million, sure. which wasn't the case. So there were players who were very good players, but as I say, they weren't at their absolute best, but we perceive most of those players in terms of like their highs, not their consistency level, because we d we've not seen them play every single week from the places that they're coming from. So for him, like he'd probably admit himself that he wasn't at his best that year for QPR, but then let's add to it as well, the fact that that year for QPR, we just about stayed up. So we were essentially a relegation type team. Yeah. So when we think about players at their peak, how many players are at the peak for a team, which just about stays up from relegation? Yeah. You know, that there's lots of stuff that feeds into it. And for him, you know, especially like an attacker, an attacker playing for a team that doesn't score a ton of goals. You know, you could say that it's your fault and so on, and you're not yeah. playing one. Well I guess the only thing I, I thought I, we believed at the time was because the money was coming in and the players were coming yeah. in. I think maybe our expectations were caught in the crosshairs 
of yeah. understanding being a team down the bottom, but having yeah, that's that's the that thing. The, the hope, the hope as far as money comes, is that things are going to be all right. Because after we stayed up that season, I thought the next year we were going to be great based on the players that we brought in. But ultimately, yeah. we at times we played okay football, but we weren't getting the results, and we were essentially still a, a relegation type team. And those players there, like. I'm very worried to call someone a bad player because there are players who don't do well in certain situations who thrive in others. And I think for Sean, who knows, if he was somewhere else at that sort of time, maybe he would have done better. But that yeah. particular setup at QPI wasn't built for everyone to be to do good. And he'll admit himself, like, as I say, the intent was there to be good, but the performances weren't there. And I think as a player, sometimes it's hard because you will be criticised for your poor play, like your intention was to not be good. You know, and that's ultimately. Yeah, I think which we've. Is a I stuff. think QPR fans generally were, you know, they were gutted because I think we saw the first four or five games and he was electric, like he he literally was electric, um, and it was and maybe you know that was the 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 Sean Wright Phillips, you know, you, you were fully aware of and obviously played with before that, um, mm. but and but I think we knew he was a good guy as well. That it was just there was just that element of confusion. He wasn't like some of those names that, you know, like. Like Basingwa, who just didn't care. Like he, yeah. he obviously cared. It just didn't. It just yeah. He just didn't. It disappeared. Yeah. I just found it. I found it strange. Yeah. It's yeah. no. No. You, I think you make some very very valid points. But like Sean, as I say, he's somebody who cared. But the difference is, like, you, your sort of patience threshold with certain people is lower mm. overall when they don't have the foundation in terms of relationship with them. And I always find as well at QPR, if somebody had a connection to Chelsea as well, for example that patience level was just that it was just a little bit it was a little yeah. bit lower if you weren't yeah, like if you're performing well then good but if you weren't then oh lord forbid but to talk to short about sean right Phillips, when i first came through he was the pinup of players coming through man city's academy i think he ended up playing for the 21s was playing for england and he was special he was a very very special talent he was the biggest name as i say at the academy he was the hope for in the same way that people talk about Foden now at city he was being spoken about in terms of um you know what he was like at to be as to be a big homegrown talent from City. And as I say, he was special, but he was such a good guy for everybody that came that came before him. Like he's taking everybody under his wing. And then to talk about my side specifically when it came down to the football element, the first year of my career, the first 10 games, I played 10 games in a row at the end of the 2004-2005 season. I think I played a few games before that. But literally my whole task was to defend and roll the ball to Sean Wright Phillips. His best season, in my opinion, was probably 2004, 2005, which is the, then the season when he went to Chelsea the year after. Roll it to him and go and support him because he was doing all sorts. He was terrorising everybody. He was one of the best players in the Premier League. I think he made team of the season that year. Mm. So I saw him at his absolute peak and I knew how humble and a good guy he was. And as I say, he was the inspiration for players coming through the academy because you wanted to be just like him. Obviously, he's an attacker and so on. But his importance to that to Man City was was nuts like he's an he's a club legend and as i say i saw some of the stuff that made him that and yeah. i saw how he carried himself during that time as well so even though you know i didn't see we he didn't see the best of himself at qpr and so on you know i had seen the very very best of him and it was uh it was special yeah well i think you know it's good it's because i obviously you know sporadically i you know it zip it was like exuberance on the ball like his his ability to sort of his dribbling it was like it's just stuck to his foot, wasn't it? A lot of the time, yeah. it was. Yeah, and, and a good finisher as well. Really good. Scored some really good goals. Really good goals. He, you know, the best one of the best things about him. I think you ask someone like Gail Clichy, who the hardest player to play against was, and he says Sean Wright Phillips because the way they used to go at people, he'd like tuck in under their arms and stuff like this, and he never really <laughs> knew which way he was going to be going. And in this, not in the same way, say like a Balassi would be doing it with tricks and so on. Sean was like incredibly direct. Yes. And I think some of the success and stuff which he had, like he worked hard to to do that. He worked hard in his game because there were times when he was being criticised heavily for this and that. But, you know, his impact, as I say, that season before he went to Chelsea, I think he scored maybe 11, 12 goals in the Premier League for a team which wasn't brilliant. Mm. I think that kind of says a lot about how good he was that year. Yeah. And I know I've noticed that it's, everyone sort of seems that such a great guy as well as an incredible mm. talent as well. Um, right. <laughs> Here's a name for you. Yeah, I saw this name like, these come last on. Two, these these, last, two these yeah, last two were crackers. These last two were crackers. Uh, oh, mate. I mean, let's go with the first one. You've got to unveil this name. I don't. I can't say this name. You're the guy who played with him. Are you talking about the striker? Or uh, the, 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 the wing uh, attacker. I've put in here Robinho. 
Okay. So Robinho was very, very significant in the history of the football club because he was the first sign in post takeover. And he was somebody who me is like a world football fan. I, this is someone I'm watching. I was, it was essentially rooting against him in the classic girls because I was a Barcelona guy. But that's Robinho. All the noise that's made about Neymar now, if all this social media stuff was 10 years earlier, the, like Robinho is the same level as Neymar. He was this outstanding young talent coming through in Brazil. He was doing this, he was doing that. The skills, the this, he was essentially the new level Galactico. Like Robinho was, oh, he was the guy. Mm. The next thing I'm watching my TV and my club's just been bought out and Robinho's <laughs> heading over to Manchester. I was like, oh, Deadline day, wasn't it? It was on deadline yeah. day, right? But hold on a second, what's going on here? But he came over and I don't think he fully knew what he signed up for because the team wasn't in a great spot at that moment. But his skill level, his ability level, like he was one of the best players the club has ever had in a time when he was surrounded by, say, people who weren't. But he was incredible. I think up in, he had the very first season, by Christmas, I think he was on nine goals maybe 10 and I think he struggled in the second half yeah but that first half oh it was <laughs> I've not seen I've not seen that before but there's a there's a spicy Brazilian playing in the Premier League and he's playing for my team yeah. and he's just over yeah. there on the left wing if you want to roll it out to him like his stuff on the ball his love for the game of football mostly the attacking elements of it but again this was someone who was really positive he was in the same way these days we've seen the best of Jesse Lingard because he was the guy because he's his mantra now is like good vibes only and stuff like that. Rubinho and Alano and those guys always smiles on their faces. They just wanted to get the ball out. Let's play some football. Let's do a rondo. Let's do some five side. They were like, their energy <laughs> you was You can incredible. hear the music, can you, as it's happening? Yeah, you can just, every time you see them, you can just picture them, like they're, they're so, so happy. And it was a time where with Marquis, you know, things were sort of more serious because we we're doing like, say, urine tests and saliva tests, check for fatigue, blah, blah, blah. But those guys, they weren't really with that but they just love the game so much. And I think their love of the game was infectious and their ability level was something which we hadn't seen at City before. Yeah. And I think he's somebody who could have fit in later iterations of the City side, but he, the, some of the stuff I saw him do was ridiculous. The, he, he's one of those obvious ones, but you pick a five-a-side team. And I always remember if, if the tears were, if Rubinho and Alana were on the same team, the game is, is, yeah. is done. But put Rubinho in a combination with Daniel Sturridge or Steven Ireland, and it's also done. <laughs> right. But Rubinho and Alana on the same team, like, lock it in. Makes no difference what your setup is. Yeah. It was done because they just played the game in a way which you just couldn't really compute. Mm. They were clinical. They'd not make anyone, everyone. And here's a guy more frustrating of all, for, especially for someone like me. He's got no, he's got no strength about him, really. Yeah. Well, you can't lean into him because it would just like use your body against you. And those players there, as is the case with like a David Silva, they're the worst because technically they're better than you. Mm -hmm. And then mentally, they know how to use your body against yourself. And the, as I say, the talent level and the significance of him, it's like it's, yeah, for me, he has to be in the team. There are certain players that kind of create, I, I, I call it a bubble. Like, and it, over the years, the bubble gets worse. So I'm seeing it now with Foden. Because yeah. initially he's like he's this young kid and he's turning up and you go and you you, you know it as a as a defender when you get done once one way you mm. go okay I'll, you sort of freeze a little bit or you don't want to engage as much because you haven't got that confidence to do that people like Ronaldinho had that kind of bubble in that first half of that season you're right Rubinho kind of had had that bubble yeah. because it was it was kind of pointless to get too too close yeah. to him and I yeah. I, I, can't, I can only imagine how exciting it must have been as a, as a youngster because th that the romance of a brazilian number 10 coming to yeah. you know to, to play but for like not a, not a washed up brazilian number 10 with all due respect like a prime time galactic old brazilian number 10 arrived in a place and you're right about the bubble because for people like him and so on like i say defending yes it is an art but it also if if a defender has a game that's 10 out of 10 and an attack has a game that's 10 out of 10 at the same time the attack will inevitably score because they can do something from a crazy distance or whatever. And there's not much you can do as a defender. You try and make it as hard as possible. But for someone like Rubinho, more often than not, not obviously not all the time because nobody's perfect. If you won the ball from him, it's because he made a mistake as opposed to you reading what he was going to do. Right. Because some of those people, they have like that sort of talent level. Like, yeah, say you make it as hard as possible, but they find a way. Like mm -hmm. the players who like, take shots between your legs. You think it's by accident, but they do it on purpose. They work on it. So what do you do? You close your legs and then you put it to the other side. Yeah. You know, 
you, you, he sort was of, one you of try and triple read it, don't you? And then and yeah. that's not because then you're conf- you're even more confused than when you yeah. started with. Unbelievable. Exactly. Um, yeah. You didn't? Did you party with Rubinho? I didn't fully party with okay, Rubinho, but he would host some part. He would help host some parties in his house in South Manchester. Yeah, and you know that's the that's the Brazilian attacker side of things. They do. <laughs> They're, they're big on enjoying themselves that's and he right, certainly did enjoy himself yeah he really did do that uh right we get to your striker and some of the, i mean the again that's what i love is with these dream teams it feels like there's a there are little themes that kind of turn up and i'm, I'm delighted that you put this player in here because you know opposite to rubinho such a lot of good feeling around rubinho um as a you know that brazilian guy your striker polar opposite really yeah the, my striker is uh nicholas and elka and he again like those early days when I was at Man City, I was very, very privileged to be in a spot where traditionally lots of young players would be bullied and have terrible treatment and so on and so forth. But one of the nicest men I've ever met in football was Nicholas Anelka. This is a guy who, say when I was coming through, he'd always make the effort with the young players to say hello, to try and help them get into the team and so on. He was always really nice with my saying hello to my mother and stuff like this to the point where every time my my mum would see him, she'd be so happy. And also looking back, like, how was he at Man City at that time in 2004 or whatever? Like that Man City, this is a guy who ended up, I think, in Champions League finals and stuff for Chelsea and what have you. Like his talent level far exceeded what Man City was in that moment. And I knew from younger, seeing him playing for Arsenal and so on and the Real Madrid things and all that, like this was an elite, elite player. So I was a guy to come from the academy into the first team. And for someone of that caliber and stature to be the, one of the most welcoming, you know, it's really humbling because I'm thinking I don't even deserve, I don't even deserve to breathe the same air as him. Mm. Yet still here he is walking with me to talk about whatever. And that was brilliant. But the downside is, as I say, the perception from the outside, it far outweighed the reality of what he was as a person because you won't find people who he played with who will say a bad word about him. Mm. But not everybody who played with him is going to come out and release a statement saying that what you're saying in terms of the perception is untrue. But he was a brilliant player, an exceptional human being. And like, as I say, if it wasn't for people like him and Richard Dunn and so on, you know, some of us coming through the academy because the city was a bit of a convey belt for that time. Most of us probably wouldn't have come through because it would have been too hostile an environment because that was the bullying culture type era of like people from the seventies and so on who hated youngsters because this, that, and the other is haze and you got to do this, got to do that. He wasn't with it. And he was the most important player for City at that time. And for him to support all the young players isn't something that most people expect, but it's something that he did. Yeah. It's something that I loved. And to be on the same field as him, like of, as an icon at that sort of age was was truly incredible. Yeah. And to, uh, you know, to have that strike, everyone's had it, be it power league or whatever, to have that striker who can get you out of a bind with, because he'll oh. take, because he'll take the chance is, hey. is huge. Um, for, for perspective, sorry, for spe- no, perspective, right. talk about specifically about him. I remember my very first game that I was involved in or in the squad for was against Chelsea in 2004. I, I was at college. On a Wednesday, I got a call from the kit man, Les Chapman, asking me, what number do I want? I was like, for what? Like, for the lottery or what are you talking about? But he said, oh, for the weekend, because you're going to be involved. And I was like, oh, oh, I don't know. So he gave me number 16 anyway. So I've always been had low numbers. And I was on the bench for the game. I was earning 80 pounds a week. And that game, City beat Chelsea 1-0. Nicholas and Elka scored a penalty. It was Chelsea's only loss for the season. And the win bonus was in the thousands of pounds range. No. <laughs> Uh, the first gift that Nicholas Nelker ever gave me was more money than I'd ever seen before in my entire life and a loss for the team that only lost one game all year. Wow, that's such a great story. Uh, the last question I want, and like I said at the start, I wanted to, you know, I'm going to be curious and if I go, if you think I'm getting this wrong or going too far, then please tell me, but I feel like it's important for me me to be brave enough to ask you this question. When I look at this when you look at Nicholas Anelka, there's a recent documentary about him and which does shed light that he's just, you know, he's generally just a little bit quieter, but it goes for his career and the, and the problems that happen there. But I look at your team and I look at, you know, Mika Richards and Jolien Lescott and, and what what they had to kind of receive in terms of the abuse with them initially. And then Nicholas yeah. Anelka as well. Do you feel like, and, and I myself in the last year or so, I've, I've tried to really kind of, Look to be empathetic, open, listen, not speak, mm-hmm. take things in and kind of look at the past uh, and be it the past five years, 10 years and go, is is that right? Was that fair? Yeah. With those kind of players, 
do you feel like their the the depiction of them and their careers or the moments in their careers do you think part of that which is a really sad th unnecessary thing um is down to the way that the the press and and not even just the press let's you know let's take accountability for general, it. Yeah. the world yeah you know where i'm going with this like do you think race yeah. has played a part in the, the depiction of those players i think for some of them it it kind of does it kind of does i don't think it's uh i think there are certain people who have created certain issues consciously but then there are others who have created it subconsciously and yeah Ultimately, the end result remains the same, whether there's intent there or there's not. Um, I think for some of those players, yes, there has been a misconception and so on and so forth. But, you know, there's, it's, I don't know. I don't know. I don't necessarily want to call out to see that's exactly what it is because for some of those players, they'll know themselves like they've not played well in certain parts and so on and whatever. Mm. But some of the criticisms that are leveled, like it's easy to be leveled with when the majority of people don't have a sense of, of empathy towards them. You know, to be... I've seen it myself. When a team's doing badly, that there is this sort of moment where all of a sudden all the foreign players become the villains, where all the Brits unite and we represent this club, not them. Yeah. And you think to yourself, like, what what is that? Why is mm. that acceptable? You know. So having seen that myself, I can see the whole perception of some of these players, as I say, going one way or the other, because ultimately they don't necessarily represent the majority. But there's, it's, it's, I think it's too simple to call yeah. it one thing. There's a lot, there's a combination of certain things. And like, there's, yeah, because I think, I also work for ESPN now and there was an element where they can't get an interview with Lukaku because of some of the things which certain people have said in the past and he now refuses to work with them. Mm -hmm. And I felt someone like Lukaku was somebody who overall... And even with Pogba as well, they receive a lot of criticism, like over the top criticism about certain things, which other players won't receive. And you can try and break it down. And the unfortunate thing is you have to ask, well, why is this player being spoken about differently to that player? And when you present that question, a lot of people in terms of an answer, you know, they might know what it is, but they won't say it. And they'll try and say anything else but that. Or oh, it's because he costs, 80 million, you say, well, this other player also cost 80 million. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's well, yeah. It's, I, it's know, just, it's, it's, I know what you're important. saying. And, and I, because uh, the reason I only bring it up, because I think it's, uh, I'm a, a Musa Okwongo is one of my favorite journalists, podcasters, uh, just an amazing person as well. I've been able to meet him a couple of times. I remember listening to him talk about, he's a Man United fan, talking about Paul Pogba and saying that it's, it's not a case of, um, you can't be negative towards Paul Pogba. You just have to kind of think about it and 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 think that it, is it fair what you're saying? And I yeah. think I think with these, when I look at back at it uh, and try and be as open as fair as possible, look the, the, the circumstances. Say for example, Julian Lescott and Micah Richards with Aston Villa. It's a bad time. You know they're getting relegated. These are players that were supposed to be come in and be you know local boys who are going to yeah. change around. So all those things play a part. I think it's more so, so so when that negativity comes, I get it and it, it, that's fair or, or an Elka moving from club to club to club. Again, I get it. It's fair. I think for me, it's the severity of it that I'm like, yeah. was the severity of it fair at, at, at these different junctures? That's where I yeah. kind of like uh, something that I was probably completely blind to for a long yeah. time. And now yeah. uh, when we can look at it a, a, a little later on, for me, it's the severity of it seems a bit unfair. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. And then to even talk about things in this day and age now, say up until, no, in fact, I think it was a month ago or whatever, I was watching, or maybe a bit longer, I was watching United play a game and Tuan Zerbe was having a bad game. Mm. And I knew what was going to come next. And lo and behold, the next day it came next. Yeah. But it came next for him. Like the all the players I'm sure had some level of abuse, but his level of abuse was more intense. So why was his more intense and why is that acceptable? You know, unfortunately, when things start to go wrong, the less sort of you can look at somebody and feel a sense of empathy because you say, are you from the same place? Do you support the same team? Do you believe in the same things? And if some of those answers are no, then all of a sudden they can't, the people want to kind of treat them like the enemy or they've got the wrong intent, they've got the wrong this and the wrong that. And ultimately that misses the point. And then if you're going to be somebody who is, say, foreign, someone who is you know, of a minority background or whatever, like those boxes, some of those boxes will never be ticked off when he comes mm -hmm. to say 
support groups of supporters and just the media itself and so on. I think if we can get closer to fair, then great. But fair is a tough thing to chase when most people think that they have been fair for the entirety anyway, because then it feels like you're challenging them, asking them to change something which they believe isn't broken. And unfortunately as well, with the way football goes, certain things are deemed to be fair because it's football. But I've also heard some of the most horrendous things, not even race related, said at a football stadium. And so I said, well, you know, that's it. You bring fans in. This is this is what you can expect. So this is what it is. But yeah. in terms of human nature, it's, some of it's awful. It is. I agree. Well said. And yeah, I just think, you know, for me, I, I, I look to question my feelings in, in terms of anything that kind of gets negative, uh, gets put out negative. Steve, let, you know, let's not, let's not it's totally about race. Stephen Ireland is a great example of that within your yeah. team, team as well. Yeah. So I think I always as... As, as football fans, when you're, you know, when you're thinking about your team, uh, I think what you've done here with this team and, and speaking to you has been honestly an absolute joy. I think it, it just, you've been able to highlight that, you know, footballers are humans and that's a great thing. Yeah. And we should enjoy, mm. enjoy the, the complexity of both situations and the players and their careers. It's just, I don't know, I know it's time to kind of wrap it up or whatever, but I spoke with Dedrick Boyata recently about his time at Celtic and there's a story there about how he left. And from the outside, there's this real crazy perception about he was a mercenary or he was whatever, it's bigger than the club and so on. And he, for the first time, told his side of the story. And he was being honest and very respectful to Celtic because he understands how big a club Celtic are. He understands that. And he loved his time there. So he made sure that came across in the thing. The podcast made the news. And in the news, there was stuff like the Daily Record, which said, Dedrick Boyata shares his story about his time leaving Celtic. And then there was something like maybe Glasgow Live or whatever it says, Dedrick Boyata slams Brendan Rodgers and this person, a Dedrick Boyata attacks Celtic and this, that and the other. So as far as it goes, if people, some people like yourself will try and see things for what it is. And it's like, this is, he said something. So we're going to report that he said something. Mm. Whereas for others who go to places where, you know, they're being fed red meat, like Dedrick Boyata, the person who they don't like, has tried to slam my club. This is my identity and he's going against it. And unfortunately, some journals and stuff, they feed they feed the base, that type of red meat, which makes situations worse. But the stuff is unfair because I believe, as I say, he just added another element to the story, but in the most respectful manner possible mm. because he understands, as I say, what, he, what the club means to him and so on. But do some people care? No, they don't. And Jed, Dedrick Bayata now is, seen as, is still seen as an outcast or whatever just because that's what people want to do because it doesn't feel like one of their own. Nedham, thank you so much. Uh, honestly, it's just been, it's just so great to chat with someone who's so honest and refreshing and articulate. And you, you, you know, I, I, a lot of my cousins, we talk about good eggs. Who's a good egg? Who's <laughs> a bad egg? You clearly, I could tell. You're, you're a good it. egg, mate. Thank you, man. No, no worries at all. And, let, uh, and here's a little little nugget for you. You can keep this in if you want. That time at QPI where someone accuses of other people of being bad eggs. No, 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 no. <laughs> No, no. Let's just say that the person who said that there were bad eggs in there was the one who was rotting the place himself. But that's none of my business. Well, thank you very much for that little bombshell at the end. I'm going to be hey, diving yeah. into that very soon. Uh, <laughs> I think I know who you mean. Um, yeah. Right. Let me just look. If you've got to this point in this in this um, video, the next thing that you need to do is to and you know, can follow Nedham on Twitter. That's fine. But more importantly than that, you have to check out Kickback with Nedham. It is fantastic. It's a brilliant podcast. You've just enjoyed, God knows, an hour and 43 minutes when I, yeah. when Nedham was only supposed to be chatting to me for an hour. He's clearly a good egg, okay? He's got a great <laughs> podcast. And more importantly with that, with that as well is amazing guests on it. Really exciting guests. And, you know, the warmth and the, the grey that you explore within it is, is cracking, mate. So everyone, go check out this podcast. The link is in the description. Please do it for me. Please do it for Nedham. Please do it for yourself. It's a great podcast. Get it done. Okay. And go. don't forget to hit subscribe on this show and ring the bell <laughs> so you don't miss out on any notifications. Oh, these, oh, these ex-players, they're starting to understand this world now. Like, beautiful, ring, stuff, ring beautiful stuff. Ring that bell. Ring that bell. Ring that bell. Uh, ring that bell. Uh, right, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, let's know what you think about uh, Nedham's uh, words and his team, of course, in the comments below. Subscribe to the channel, as Nedham said himself. And we'll see you next time.